Yeah, I can see you. Can you uh, can you hear me? I apologize, sir. The uh, I'll, I'll make your introduction very very short, sir. The last five minutes, it's been a long day. The last five minutes, I've been running through the hotel here, trying to find you in the speaker green room, and then I realized uh, you're you're briefing <laughs> virtually, sir. So it's been it's been a day from from hell, uh, but it's been very very productive. Um, the uh, uh, Mr. Madsen, um, please everybody welcome uh, the deputy DIU, right? And and specifically, I asked him to brief tonight. Um, him to brief tonight, and then um, uh, Dr. Tompkins from DARPA to brief tomorrow night to really kind of set the stage in terms of this, the severity and the, the, um, um, the, the persistence and the perniciousness um, of the, the China th threat that we're going to have to face. Really, it's going to be a technology fight. And so I, I see DIU and I see DARPA, and that handful of organizations that have that capability to have a huge impact in that fight is being critical. And with that in mind, uh, please welcome Mr. Madsen. Thank yes, sir. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. And my apologies for any part I had of you uh, trucking through uh, the hotel looking It's for okay, it, sir. You. It was my fault entirely. Yeah, no, uh, no problem. Uh, well, it's great to be here uh, with this uh, fantastic audience, people from DOD, uh, the traditional defense industrial base, the national security innovation base. Um, great folks assembled to talk about this very important topic. Uh, you know, a couple of themes that I've heard throughout the day so far, Honda Gertz told us about speed and scale. Uh, during General Brown's uh, piece, I heard about accelerate change or lose. And I'm going to double down on each of those as we go through this. Uh, DOU just celebrated our uh, five-year anniversary. Uh, and we celebrated really what got us here, kind of looking back, what got us here. Um, but uh, we're really... Past that now, we're looking forward uh, as far as what the future looks like and the work to be done, because there is uh, much more work to be done, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about new solutions, uh, new vendors, new talent, and the importance of speed and scale to get that done. So as I mentioned, DIU was started in 2015 by then Secretary of Defense Ash Carter. Uh, he astutely recognized that there were barriers to entry to the defense marketplace to, to a lot of agile tech companies, and he wanted a way to more quickly get that technology into the hands of the men and women in uniform. Uh, and, you know, he wanted to do this by rebuilding the connected tissue between government and the tech sector. Uh, it's not, not something new. Uh, rebuild that triangle of academia, industry, and government that really birthed Silicon Valley and the tech sector writ large uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, the initial go-do was to accelerate commercial technology to DOD. Uh, and we first started as tech discovery, but we shifted to focusing on the demand side. So every project we take on starts with a DOD partner with a simply stated problem statement uh, and a DOD partner funding to move that forward. And we put it out to the commercial sector and we look for a five page white paper or a 15 page slide deck and return again, trying to uh, simplify it. Secretary Mattis came in, he liked what we were doing. He said, look, you guys have proven the concept, but now look to take on those projects that can scale across a department, across services, across platforms to truly transform the capability and capacity of the department. And of course, foundational to both of those is growing the national security innovation base. Uh, now we do work a little bit differently uh, than others. Uh, our project life cycle is designed to more closely replicate the commercial production cycle. Uh, we focus on speed, maximize competition, and minimize vendor time to participate. We've identified all of those elements as barriers to entry, and we look to lower those barriers. Uh, we also work across the joint force, and this gives us a firsthand user knowledge of some of the problems facing the joint force, uh, as well as a joint mandate to allow to scale beyond the individual service or platform. And over the years, uh, we've also developed two internal teams uh, that are focused on our stakeholders on the supply and demand side. So we have a defense engagement team that engages with our defense department partners to fully understand the problems, to curate the problems with them. We get away from a requirements-based uh, uh, request for proposal process and, and rather a simply stated problem statement. And then the other side is our commercial engagement team. They're out in the commercial tech ecosystem uh, to understand the uh, landscape of the commercial sector uh, with the companies as well as the venture capital participants. Next slide. DIU, uh, when you think of DIU, DIU is made up of three components. Most folks think of DIU as the uh, upper right, the core DIU. 
but together, these three uh, units, Cord EIU, the National Security Innovation Capital, and the National Security Innovation Base, strengthen the National Security Innovation uh, Base uh, talent and technology pipeline. And this is also designed to expand the non traditional vendor base that Core DIU draws on. And also along the X axis, there you can see that we look to cover the entire uh, development from the concept stage all the way to the production stage of that technology and include the participants uh, along the vertical axis there. Now, Core DIU, that's a DID, DOD organization. Uh, focused exclusively on leveraging commercial technology and fielding that technology at the speed of relevance. Uh, there are six tech focus areas that we are organized around AIML, autonomy, human systems, commercial space, cybersecurity, and advanced energy and materials. Uh, shouldn't be a surprise to too many folks uh, in the audience, uh, but we have found these are the areas that are undergoing the greatest rate of change in the commercial sector and also align with the defense mission set, whether it's kinetic or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, we also uh, uh, see that's where the commercial capital investment is uh, much, much greater than government R&D. Uh, National Security Innovation Capital is an initiative to catalyze investment in dual use hardware uh, and stimulate private investment. Uh, we were appropriated in 2021, so we we're just appropriated. Uh, we just put a, out our website and we are sending our implementation plan over to the Hill. National Security Innovation Network, it builds on networks of innovators uh, to generate new solutions for national security problems. Now, Ensign, their marquee product is a course called Hacking for Defense that they take to the network of universities to solve those problems. There's a DOD sponsor with the problem and master's level students that solve that. A great example of that is a company called Capella Space uh, that has gone through significant development. Uh, DIU, uh, saw this, saw the potential of this technology uh, due to the lack of SAR capability uh, available. And DIU became an early funder and an early sponsor of this technology with the DoD partner. We've helped to advance that and move that along. Uh, another element of that is that these new space satellite companies uh, execute agile engineering that rapidly move technology over time, uh, leveraging those commercial cycles. Next slide, please. DIU works closely with all services to rapidly field technology based on our joint mandate I mentioned before. Now, modernization of the department is going to take all players, uh, all participants in the defense marketplace. From scaling across DOD to scaling across the US government, one of our next focus areas that we really want to uh, develop and work on is our relationship with systems integrators. Uh, and now teaming between the traditional and the non-traditional companies is not new or unusual. And in fact, the authority that allows us to operate provides, uh, it favors non-traditional companies, but it pro provides provisions to partner with the traditional defense industrial base. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the past, we have partnered with systems integrators in our UAS, uh, as well as our uh, space portfolios. And now, while DIU is modestly funded, uh, we are able to leverage a significant amount of our uh, DOD partner funding for projects. Next slide. So in the 60s, about 40% of global R&D was U.S. Defense Department related. Now, only 3% of global R&D is U.S. Defense Department related. So what does that mean? Business as usual is not going to work anymore, and we need to, uh, to change the way that we work. Uh, the commercial sector outspends government by about $250 billion per year in R&D, and that's DIU's value space. That's, uh, in fact, why we were uh, started. Uh, most technology of consequence is now being developed in the commercial sector, whereas it used to be developed with a DOD sponsorship. And we have to make it easier for DOD to be an early adopter and a fast follower uh, in the key areas where technology is being developed in the commercial sector. Uh, DAU optimizes taxpayer money by leveraging uh, the large capital investment in the commercial sector, uh, the commercial diligence, and the private sector scouting. One of the areas we've started focusing on is our transition rate. Uh, if we were 100%, that would tell me we were not taking on enough risk. Uh, so we're continuing to, uh, to do things to move that forward. Now, compared to would-be adversaries, it's clear that China currently is laser focused on transforming their economy through uh, advanced technology. And they have a couple programs. One of them is Civmil Fusion, uh, where commercial technology 
is automatically made available to the PLA and it's overseen by the president, in fact. Uh, here, uh, not to say we want to adopt that uh, model at all, but we have to get folks to want to work with us. And let's face it, it takes some large muscle movements. So uh, DIU continues to work to lower those barriers to entry to those companies. Next slide. Our mission is directly aligned with uh, DOD priorities and the HASC Future of Defense Task Force uh, recommendations. I think we heard a little bit about that uh, earlier today as well. Uh, dual use technology is increasingly important. Uh, and yeah, you prototype the technology, uh, we prototype the technology, uh, but we also prototype methodologies as well as the commercial cycles. Uh, commercial product development cycle is well inside the turn radius of the DOD budgeting cycle. Uh, and we found that that's a, a, a challenge to uh, maintain that speed with the commercial development cycle. Uh, in fact, we're, um, we're uh, operationalizing a handful of recommendations from the future of defense uh, task force, as you can see outlined here. Uh, and we also, also want to continue to attract talent and, and in fact, increase uh, that throughput of talent that is coming to the department by lowering barriers to entry for uh, those talented folks with uh, solution providers, whether they're civilian or subject matter experts. Uh, next slide, please. We'd like to take this home and, uh, and learn some lessons about uh, things that have recently happened and apply them going forward. The U.S. used to lead the global drone market, uh, but that is not the case anymore. Uh, there's one drone company now that controls about 80% of the global drone market, so we don't have a wholly domestic capability. Uh, our blue UAS project outlined here was designed to recapture that capability by uh, leveraging a whole of government uh, economic buying power. And more than a technology problem, we also have to be aware when there are cultural problems or policy problems to solve. And to meet uh, today and tomorrow's challenges, we're looking at uh, to change that culture as well. Uh, Blue UAS is the overarching line of effort that we have to include larger platforms, uh, components, policy, and acquisition coordination. And as I mentioned, to build this capability, uh, it's designed to aggregate the buying power across U.S. government. We're working with uh, DHS, uh, state, FAA, and others uh, on this project. And again, this is an example of not only prototyping a technology, but prototyping a methodology to posture DOD to keep pace with the speed and scale of the commercial development, not just uh, domestic development, but also would-be adversarial development. Next slide, please. Uh, so look, domains of competition um, are no longer exclusively military. Now they include economic, military, uh, ideological, as well as uh, geopolitical alignment. Uh, du dual use technology, as I mentioned, is important. Uh, there's been significant energy around acquisition reform uh, that we've seen, but there's been uh, much less focus on the accompanying budget reform that we need to go along with that. Uh, and the bottom line uh, here is that we need to uh, keep up investing in R&D. Uh, we need to help DOD be a more sophisticated partner for commercial industry by being able to match uh, commercial speeds and look like a uh, commercial entity uh, to our commercial partners uh, when appropriate. Next slide, please. We do post all of our solicitations on our website. And again, a very simple process, a five page white paper, 15 page slide deck. When we do have those open solicitations, you can see those there. Uh, additionally, we're always looking for folks to work with us, uh, looking for uh, folks that uh, are thinking about different ways of doing business and other ways to accelerate commercial technology into DOD. Thank you, I look forward to questions. Hey, Mike, thanks so much. This is Patrick Murphy, the former Undersecretary of the Army, and I appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, we're going to turn, we have a bunch of folks that want to ask questions, so I'm going to turn right from get go to Tara Kopp from uh, Defense One. Tara, do you have a question for Mike, please? She's trying. You are cutting in and out. I now. sense her. Yeah. Okay, so. Um Hi, uh, this is Tar. There she is. Hi. We got Hi. her. Yeah, I couldn't hear the studio, I so uh, I was wondering if uh, we were uh, we're going through. Um, hi, Mike. Uh, my name is Tara Kopp, and uh, as you likely know, I'm the Defense One reporter that wrote about the DODIG 
complaint at DIU. Um, and in the week since that story came out, um, multiple employees, both at DIU and NSIN, have come forward talking about climate issues at both agencies, including um, climate issues at NSIN that um, potentially led to uh, Managing Director Morgan Plummer being asked to step down. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts about, you know, is this um, is this just part of the challenge of having to act fast and DIU not being a private company but needing to behave like one in some ways to be able to speed innovation and anything that you can say about what you or what uh, leadership at NSIN is doing to address the challenges would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Right. And, and sir, not to be inappropriate, sir, that's really the purpose is going to be focusing on warfighter technology for the warfighter. So it, I, I leave that those types of questions entirely to your discretion about, about whether to respond and how to respond at all, sir. Okay, no, uh, no, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the mission of DIU, uh, to include NSIC and Ensign, is to leverage the commercial technology get it in the hands of uh, our men and women in uniform um, as quickly as possible with the authorities that we have been granted. Uh, and we continue to operate uh, within those authorities. Uh, we leverage a variety of U.S. government and maybe competitive and direct hiring uh, authorities that are available to uh, to everyone. Um, we have um, very clear processes to highlight uh, issues uh, to leadership, and we take those uh, very seriously. You uh, indicated the Ensign uh, case. I, I really can't uh, uh, talk about that because we, we did take that seriously, and we are diving into that, and we're taking a, a look at that. Um, I suspect there will be uh, more to follow on that. But uh, what, uh, you know, just to pivot a little bit, because um, it is about leadership and getting technology to the men and women in uniform too. Talk about just a couple of things uh, under the current leadership that, uh, that has occurred, uh, for example, in that vein. Um, look, over the last uh, year alone, we have doubled the uh, proposals that we've received. We received almost 1,000 proposals for projects uh, last year. 35% uh, increase in the number of projects that we're starting uh, for, uh, for the technology. So we're opening up that national security innovation base. We brought in about 190 companies, companies who have previously evaluated the defense marketplace and said, you know what, no thanks. It's too complex, it's too expensive, it takes too long. And I have a whole separate uh, customer consumer base over here, so I'm not gonna participate. Uh, so we've been able to bring in 190 of those companies and not just on prototype contracts. Many of those have gone on to uh, other contracts, working as a sub to a prime, uh, for example. Uh, and we brought in, um, of those, we brought about 87% are non-traditional uh, companies. About 75% are small businesses where uh, they're very, very agile uh, and they can move and they can leverage that technology very, very quickly. Uh, Mike, are you are you partnering and giving the advice to these companies to so they su survive that valley of death that unfortunately has been too often the case in years past? Uh, we are, and in fact, we've, uh, you know, we talk about a valley of death, kind of a late stage valley of death, but we've, we've kind of identified, you know, a couple of other maybe smaller depth valleys of death, uh, but at each kind of stage of that uh, uh, technology development, there are challenges to continue to, to move that along. And absolutely, we work with uh, those companies to lower those barriers. Uh, like I mentioned, we don't, we don't look for a uh, long, onerous requirements document, but rather just a simply stated problem statement. And then we go through a prototyping process. A quick example I'll give is uh, related to our, our drone uh, projects. We're working with the Army to develop a, a drone uh, for squad level use, so a small drone handheld, rugged. And we narrowed it down to about five uh, drone producers, and we were able to, as part of the prototyping phase, get them out to a range, put this technology in the hands of the end user uh, so they could take a look at it. Now, the drone manufacturers were making making drones for you and me in, in suburbia America, where we're, we're out in the backyard or in the park kind of doing it their hand. And they saw, you know, once they saw the end users were going to be actuating these with combat gloves on and bulky, uh, bulky clothes and bulky uniforms, they were able to take that input real time, go, go back, make some changes and come back the very next day and say, okay, try this one now. Uh, that doesn't work, okay, try this one now. So you can iterate very, very rapidly instead of taking them back to the requirements process of saying, okay, we need, we need the toggles now to be an inch and a quarter long instead of an inch long. 
uh, and we're able to uh, increase those cycles, again, leveraging that, that commercial uh, product cycle. That's great. Thanks, Mike. We're going to turn now to Dave Patterson uh, from SMA. Hi, Dave. He's up there. We can see him. He's up there. I see you, but I can't hear you. He sounds like he's muted, sir. You know what, Dave? We're going to come back to you if that's okay. We're going to go to uh, Aaron uh, Meta from Defense News. Aaron, you're up. And Mr. Hi, Patterson, we'll go back to you in a second. Aaron? Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay, Dave Patterson, we'll go to you then. <laughs> okay, thank you. We, Mr. Madsen, we... thank you for, uh, for participating. It's always... Uh, a treat to find someone who takes things from ideas to actual products uh, in a, a swift manner. I'm, a, I'm going to have I have a, a process question, and it appears as as I look at your charts that uh, you go from really great idea and you know something really cool, a uh, garage based idea, to a prototype. Awesome! That's that's really great. That's the kind of thing that everybody is looking for. But on the other hand, going from prototype to manufacturability or producibility, that is a big leap in terms of providing capability. In your vetting process for your investment targets, is that a criteria that you use in determining who would be best uh, for that investment? Yeah, that's a great question, Dave. I appreciate that. And, and back to your uh, to your opening comment, it, it is a blast uh, to work with the uh, the entrepreneurial minds of uh, of the U.S. It's amazing the people that are out there. And I always say this is the second most fun I've had in my professional life because I used to fly airplanes for the Air Force, and it's kind of hard to compete with that. But it's a uh, it's a fantastic uh, number two on there. So it, it is a lot of fun to see the technology uh, out there and watch it develop for sure. Um, so, so to your point, that, that's a um, that's a critical thing that we've really gotten after. Is that what, I think what you're getting at is uh, the transition rate, transitioning uh, products from a successful prototype onto uh, production, program of record, uh, what have you. There, and we spent a lot of time over the last two years really examining that. Um, that was the genesis of those two internal teams that I mentioned. We we started those teams to help with that process to fully identify what the transition plan is. Uh, from our DoD partner before we even take on the plan. So what we didn't want is a prototype for the sake of prototype. So we work with our uh, the DoD partner to ensure that they have a plan in place, and it's a viable plan, an executable plan to transition it. Now, one thing as we've gone through this that we've come to realize, and that's where we recognize the disconnect between acquisition reform and budget reform, there have been several cases where the prototype was successful, DoD partner wanted to, uh, to bring it on and put it in their budget, but it was done too early. So it was out of cycle of the, uh, the DOD, PPBE, or the POM, the, uh, the budgeting process. So now you're talking about a 12 to 18 month delay, technology becomes stale, the company has to let folks go. So that's one of the things that we started getting after is, is some of those external things on how we can continue to improve our process. But I think back, back to your point, um, we include that element into a rigorous internal process we have before we take on a project. Um, because you're right, it's great to see the early tech. Um, we work in uh, technology readiness level six to nine, so we're looking for uh, fully developed commercial products with a commercial consumer base uh, that we can then take it and through minor customization and proving through prototyping, use that to solve a DOD problem. So we're looking for uh, a little bit more baked uh, right. technology. We do work with DARPA to pick up their early stage and, and move it on. But we put that to our internal rigorous process to evaluate, you know, one of the first questions is, um, is this a problem that there's a commercial solution for? Are they asking us to make a Virginia class submarine, for example, in uh, Silicon Valley? That's clearly uh, no one is, is doing that. Um, and, and so we make sure that there's a, a uh, commercial solution for it. We make sure that there's a robust commercial ecosystem. So we'll have multiple vendors that compete uh, for this. We can get the best from the uh, the minds of the men and women. Uh, and, and we go through this process. It's very open. Uh, it's very flat. Uh, anyone can ask questions. And it, it's pretty exciting because you can you can throw out any ideas, but you have to defend them uh, from, from a, uh, a very thoughtful 
way and we get the best product of that and the transition piece has always been a, a critical uh, part of that uh, for the folks that we're working with. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Mike, we're going to turn to Jeff Green now. Jeff, what's your question for, for Mike Batson? Great. Uh, Mike, I, I noticed the blue UAS slide and took a lot of interest in that. So uh, at DIU, what obstacles has the department uh, seen that they need to overcome to stay ahead of near peer adversaries, especially when it comes to developing and more importantly, fielding autonomous capabilities in places like comms disconnected environments? Yeah, uh, Jeff, that is a fantastic question. Um, and it really takes me back to uh, accelerate fast or lose. Um, our would-be adversaries, China, is uh, using regulatory and security policies to attain tech dominance. Um, they're really advanced in the marketplace, and so we need to ensure that we are staying on par with the things that they're doing. Um, and, and I think, you know, from your question, kind of what's what's hidden in there uh, and what you didn't specifically say, but the advantage is going to go to not who developed it first, but to who uh, to whoever is able to integrate uh, that technology uh, into the way that they uh, the fight. That's where the, the, the winner's going to come out there. Um, so we need to, we need to, I'd say very broadly under an umbrella, we need to leverage and learn um, from uh, technology uh, being developed in the commercial sector. But we also need to uh, learn from past experiences. The UAS example is a great example that we used to lead. The U.S. used to lead that sector. We don't anymore. We need to apply that to 5G and uh, other things. Uh, we also need to uh, learn lessons from the commercial sector's ability to combine technologies. Uh, we've learned that AI really underpins almost all of our portfolio areas, for example. We've combined, we've had some projects where we've combined AI with autonomy, uh, where we've combined AI with uh, cybersecurity uh, to automatically detect and mitigate unknown cybersecurity risks. Um, and so, um, you know, the department's been... Uh, definitely prototyping technology and we need to increase that uh, prototyping of the methodologies that the commercial sector uh, has done. And we need, again, we need to make help DOD look more like a commercial sector, uh, move at commercial speeds and cycles. Uh, example I use is Shield AI, uh, a great company we worked with early on uh, with the special ops folks and they developed a, uh, a quadcopter that really has, has life-saving capabilities. Uh, it partners uh, autonomy, uh, a drone with uh, AI capability. So think of a GPS denied environment or a, a comms uh, environment, comms uh, reduced environment. And an uh, example is a, uh, a building where now uh, a, a special ops squad does not have to kick down a door and go into something that's unknown. They can uh, throw this uh, quadcopter into a structure that will automatically map the entire building, identify threats, uh, all in a, uh, a GPS denied or comms denied uh, environment. So uh, those folks, before they even go in there, they know the threats are facing, they know the layout, they know all of those things from a drone that uh, can fly around using uh, AI machine learning, uh, not be controlled uh, by anyone outside the building. Mike, I'm going to turn now, uh, if it's okay, to, to Aaron uh, Mehta uh, from Defense News. Hello, Aaron. I can't see you or hear you. Hey, Mike, let me uh, take personal privilege and ask you if you don't mind. Listen, I know you're a graduate of University of Nebraska. Uh, you flew for the United States Air Force. Walk us through, obviously, you know, your perch from, you know, IUX, IUX, uh, IOU, I'm sorry, DIU, but walk us through AFWORKS, Army Futures Command, NAVAX, like, walk us through as you see uh, the landscape. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, um, a couple of years ago, uh, we made an attempt to map out folks in the innovation space. And it becomes a challenge right away because uh, it's hard to map it in a, a uh, X, Y axis uh, or even an X, Y, Z axis um, and really get to make any, any sense of it. Uh, so it's, it's really hard to uh, very briefly describe uh, each of those. But more broadly, um, you know, they cover down on different technology areas. I talked about DARPA uh, early stage. We work with them on some technology that we've picked up and we've advanced. But I think, you know, looking at the big picture, I talked about DOD being a uh, early adopter or a fast follower. And honestly, uh, all of those uh, folks have a role to play in that, uh, in, in helping the department get to be a fast follower for that technology. I mentioned our would-be adversaries have, have specific uh, centrally planned and directed uh, 
policies to do that, and we need these organizations to to help be a fast follower. We work very very closely with all the organizations that you mentioned. I talked about DARPA uh, with AFWorks. Uh, we need meet with them. Uh, Bi-weekly, uh, very regularly, to uh, make sure uh, we're aware of uh, which projects uh, folks are working on. Uh, we had a project; they, they call it Agility Prime, but it's a uh, it's a, uh, a drone capability that can transport combat troops on a battlefield, EV tall electronic vertical takeoff and landing, completely silent. So, if you think of the applications on a battlefield, there it's uh, it's pretty significant uh, in in that regard. So, we work well uh, with all of those folks in the ecosystem. Uh, and DIU was uh, recently, well, two years ago, repositioned into the uh, Undersecretary for Research and Engineering. Uh, initially, when DIU stood up, we were a direct report to the DEF, SecDef, astutely so, recognizing that bringing a change of way we do business was going to take uh, take some top cover to really get some uh, some wins to then continue on, and we've been able to do that and prove it out. And, and we moved into R&E. Uh, so now we're aligned with uh, many others in the innovation uh, space. Uh, space Development Agency is there. We work very closely uh, with those folks with uh, developing the technology and then uh, eventually deploying it with those folks. So uh, organizationally, uh, we work uh, with the folks there, but even uh, in an informal basis, we work uh, across the innovation space uh, for others uh, that are occupying that. Mike, we have about one more one more minute. That's okay. I, I have one last question, Jim. Is that okay if I go for it? Oh, go ahead. That, and I, I had one. Go ahead. Okay, sir, great. Dive in. Hey, Mike, if you don't mind me asking, what keeps you up at night? Oh, I'll tell you what. What keeps me up at night? Um, is this an adult program? Uh, it's, yes, well, I'll say boring go stuff. Uh, because I don't know. But, but boring stuff is what keeps me up at night. Um, why boring stuff? Because boring stuff represents a lack of imagination. And if you look at the national security sphere, if you look at military operations uh, in history, uh, so many catastrophic events have been a result of a lack of imagination. Um, I'll cite the, the tragic events of uh, September 11, 2001. Um, it, it, our would-be adversaries were, were pressing the bounds. They were using commercial aircraft as weapons. Uh, and they were very imaginative in that. Some would say it's, it's asymmetric warfare, sure, but uh, it's the lack of imagination to see the cycles that our adversaries are going through and not being able to imagine that and then start matching that. So that, that is what keeps me up at night. Yes, sir. That was an excellent question. And, and sir, I should have asked this at the beginning. I apologize. That I'm, I'm the last guy out of the gate. I apologize. What, what are the types of, you have a bird's eye view, kind of the, what's, we're, the, the upcoming uh, China technology fight? What, what, what are the types of pernicious things are you seeing from your perch, whether it's adversarial capital, whether it's the, 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 the buying of the IP? What, what, what's, what's the toolbox that they're bringing to the table for, to, to execute their global dominance uh, uh, campaign? Well, you, you've hit on uh, all of those, uh, and they'll be successful in the short term. Um, adversarial capital, uh, illegal tech transfer, uh, the theft of IP. In fact, uh, those are some of the reasons that National Security Innovation Capital was developed, uh, was being able to, to push that out before it really got started. Uh, but it is all those things. They're, they're, uh, our would-be adversaries are very aggressive. Uh, Laser-like focus, like I mentioned, on uh, modernizing their economy uh, through the technology advancement, okay, but but look, uh, we need to uh, we need to think and get back to what made us great and what made us leaders, the leaders that we are in this area. It was the serial entrepreneurship. It was the ability to take risks and understand that we took those risks, and if it didn't work out, we just identified a way that didn't work, pivot right. and and press on right. and move forward uh, with that. You know, our, our real proven asset is our ability to uh, out iterate our uh, our adversaries. Uh, and we just need to uh, continue that. You know, we see a lot of, um, uh, like I said, I fly airplanes in the Air Force. I see a, a C-17 uh, uh, clone uh, that our adversaries have developed, uh, you know, from uh, reverse engineering. So when they stop reverse engineering what we're doing, that's, that's the time right. to really be concerned because uh, we will, that'll indicate that we've lost that edge of, of out iterating our adversaries. Uh, that cycle I talked about before. Yes, sir. And Mike, I really appreciate you talking about American ingenuity. We know you're at the tip of the spear when it comes to American innovation, uh, and, and it is our culture. It has been our culture for, for decades. I mean, you look at some of those global iconic brands out there, Nike, Walmart, 
FedEx, all started by veterans coming back from war and starting these organizations. So largest retailer, Walmart, largest media company, Comcast, largest logistics company, FedEx, GoDaddy, et cetera. Um, so we really appreciate your time today. We appreciate what you do uh, at the tip of the spear when it comes to American innovation. I'll turn it to Jim to, to close this out. Yes, sir. Closing comments for the day. I have no comments. I didn't think we'd get this far, thank God. Oh, no, I apologize. That wasn't live, was it? The, uh, we've had a great first day. Um, we're halfway through. We've got the rest of the service chiefs tomorrow. It'll be an action packed, uh, just like we did today. Uh, we'll start tomorrow morning at um, 8.45 a.m. with General Fick, the F-35 uh, program executive officer. I, I can't imagine who'd be watching a $400 billion program at 8.45 in the morning. Um, and then uh, this will be the prelude <coughs> Uh, to uh, uh, next year when we finally uh, uh, get to uh, uh, get together in person again on March 9th at the McAleese uh, uh, conference at the Ronald Reagan Center with our 700 uh, gathering of 750 of our closest friends as usual uh, to celebrate post COVID-19. So uh, have a great night. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, uh, may God bless our troops. Good night, people. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.